Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our session on the Global Genetics and Genomics Community, or G3C for short. Um, G3C is an online unfolding interactive genetics and genomics case study website that serves as both a learning and education tool. Um, and in this session, we're gonna provide a summary of the features of G3C, provide an overview of the different uses of G3C, and both describe and give you a demonstration of some of the cases and the content available in this website. In this session, you can enter questions at any point in the Q&A box, and we'll address the questions at the end of the session. Um, and this session is being recorded for future viewing. Uh, speaking today will be Yi Liu, who is a genetic counselor in the genetics branch at the National Cancer Institute. And my name is Kathy Calzone. I'm uh, in the role as a research geneticist and head of the genomic healthcare section in the genetics branch at the National Cancer Institute. So we will now go ahead and start the session. Hello, everyone. I'm Yi. I'm a genetic counselor from the National Cancer Institute, the genetics branch. Uh, today, um, Kathy and I are going to give you an overview of uh, an um, interactive uh, online educational tool. It's called the uh, Global Genetics and the Genomics Community, short for G3C. As the increasing uh, discovery in genetics and the genomics, and it's crucial for clinicians and the students uh, are in training, how they integrating those um, um, increased um, knowledge to practice and, and how to utilize it in clinical care. Then we're thinking about uh, what will be the best way for um, this, um, um, for the learners to learn those information. Um, then through literature research and uh, our clinical experience, we think um, um, learners can learn best when they utilizing what they learned in the textbook and uh, utilizing in the uh, um, clinical care. So this is how um, G3C was born, which is uh, we have a collection of unfolding case study to use um, uh, for use um, uh, with the learners. So the learners can be students, can be pro pro practicing health pro uh, providers, and that they can learn the basic of uh, genomics concept through um, interview simulated uh, patients. And um, um, through this process, they can complete uh, a supplemental learning activities, um, such as um, practice how to answer these questions and the join pedigrees. And also, um, they, are, they can hear from the experts who are coming from the topic of this kind of cases to learn um, how they address, they are addressing the current uh, issues regarding those cases. Um, there are some features content of the G3C. Uh, right now, there are um, about like 18 cases um, um, in the G3C website. And uh, the cases can go through um, from um, cardiac, from um, prostate cancer, colon cancer, and um, the, uh, um, the patient selection are ethnically and diverse. Um, the reason we're trying to mimic uh, the community of the patients we are serving. And also we are focusing on some um, common public uh, uh, health issues such as the access to um, um, health care and um, um, others um, will be important in the clinical setting. And those cases are portable and the web-based and it's open access to everyone. So it's um, a uh, free registration and uh, it's, um, um, it's uh, flexible for people to use. The cases are interactive and the uh, self-paced you can choose which question to ask the, the a patient and you can stop at any time. And uh, the questions have um, um, different uh, routes and so it's self-directed. 
and it's an uh, unfolding case study. So it depends on which question you are choosing, and it will lead to different kinds of scenarios, how the story is going to present um, to you. Also, the um, professional actors and others will be, an, it, it is uh, using used in the G3C as a simulated uh, uh, patient. So the uh, learners can have the similar kinds of experience when they go to simulating center um, in the um, in a academic setting. Um, in the process, there are incorporated uh, learner education activities and the resources being provided so that uh, learners can go into the activity and the resource to enforce what they uh, would, would love to learn and uh, enforce the, the knowledge and um, um, enforce the knowledge. And faculty support was included as well. And some, um, some faculties uh, would love to use this website to um, in, uh, integrate it in the, their curriculum to teach students. And um, some suggestions are provided by the website. Um, once you go into G3C, you will see a login and uh, registration um, button, and it's um, uh, free registration. Then you follow the, the uh, username and the password, then you set up account. So in this way, it allows you to track the progress and it's enable you stop a case and return where it left off. And here to share with you about um, some unique features of um, um, G3C. The first one is the expert uh, commentaries. So those are experts who are familiar with um, the topic or the case is presented um, in a specific uh, um, specific um, um, case, and they can be uh, address um, questions like uh, the how realistic the um, the case to the current practice and. Um, how the genomics um, um, like information is uh, integrated in the case and um, or there is any like a conflict or controversies associated with the case and also they can they would uh, bring up uh, like um, ethical legal social issues associated with uh, um, associated with the case and the uh, commentary are based on um, on their experience and on their clinical practice, and uh, also they will give you recommendations uh, on um, on what will be help helpful for the learners uh, to understand uh, the topic. And here I'm going to share with you um, what's the flavor a um, expert commentary looks like. So this case is, again, really interesting because there are a number of controversies associated with genetic testing in autism. So the one that I'd like you to keep in mind as a clinician is our best efforts to look at genetic testing uh, in ASD. Again, I mentioned it's a huge, a huge diagnostic category. There's so many different forms of ASD. So on average, when you do genetic testing for ASD, you get a quote unquote positive answer. You find a genetic variant associated with ASD in that child anywhere between 15 and 30 percent of the time, 15 percent being on the lower end if you're using microarrays, and 30 percent of the time being on the higher end if you're using genome sequencing. So that means that 70 to 85 percent of the time, their family is going to get a negative result from genetic testing. So it's really important as a clinician to set expectations appropriately that the behavioral test to diagnose ASD is different from any genetic test, which is only looking for specific factors. Because when I talk to years uh, or psychologists with years of experience and they deal with families all the time, they order genetic testing in this case, the very first question that they get from the parents when the genetic test comes back negative that no linked variant was found is, so that means my child doesn't have ASD which is not, we can't say that, right? All we can say is that we could not find a specific genetic cause beh behind the ASD that we've diagnosed behaviorally in your child. So that's really important for you to think about as a clinician to be able to set expectations appropriately and be prepared to have that discussion with the family when uh, those uh, results come back. And here is another uh, unique feature for G3C, which is 
is uh, the uh, fa faculty case guide. So faculty case guide is a, a PDF that's um, uh, inputted uh, in each case, and it will have the case objectivity, suggestions for users, uh, and the supplement the student activity. Um, and so the person who wanted to utilize in G three C in the uh, uh, teaching um, setting, and they can use the faculty guide. Uh, to help them how to design the study part. And there are additional reading and the resources provided in the faculty guide. Um, here I'm going to transition to um, Kathy and she will continue giving you um, discussion regarding G3C. Hi everyone. My name is Kathy Kelzone. I'm also in the genetics branch at the National Cancer Institute and work with Yi. And I'm going to continue talking about G3C and begin with how learners can benefit by using G3C. Um, and the first is that there's a variety of different cases. So individual learners have the opportunity to be able to select a case that is either relevant to their practice or relevant to what they're learning about and be able to focus on those specific kinds of topics that are of interest to them. Um, it simulates a healthcare provider experience and encounter. Um, you are actually interviewing patients and you hear a response and you need to begin to integrate that into how you would think about how you would respond to a patient given those circumstances. And that's done in the mechanism of being able to select what question you would pick next being able to do supplemental learner activities to help you understand some of the things that were brought up in the video itself, and being able to actually simulate to the best that we can um, real life clinical encounters. Um, all of these cases provide some degree of learning basic genomic concepts. <laughs> And so that varies depending on the case. It's always case specific, but those basic concepts are actually very important um, as a foundation for utilizing genomics in healthcare provider practice anyway. Um, and as the case progresses, there's the supplemental learning activities that can be completed and the opportunity to hear from experts that are well recognized in the field about their view of the case, how real it is, what kinds of controversies and so forth that are involved with the case. So how has G3C been used in, in real practice in an academic or continuing education environment? Um, and we've actually learned a lot from users of G3C about how they've been able to use it in a variety of different ways. So let's start with the academic setting and begin with how different faculty have integrated this into lectures. Um, and that is to pull out specific case points that they're trying to hone in on and to reinforce some of the content that they've actually taught their students already in didactic content. Some of them have utilized student assignments um, to explore specific case um, and that can be an assignment within the classroom environment. It can be an assignment that is a homework assignment or a pre-work assignment prior to class. Um, there can be faculty guided activities where faculty members can actually show a video clip, stop the video, and then have a classroom discussion about you know, the controversies, the ethics of the case, the kinds of um, issues that were brought up, some of the psychosocial considerations. Um, that can be an engaged discussion with the learners or it can be in small group activities where you show a video clip and then break into small groups and the individual groups report on different aspects of a, of a given case. Um, we've had um, a development of cases that are multi-ethnic 
And that was very deliberate because that's much more reflective of the kinds of patients that all of us would see in practice. It's a variety of different ages and a variety of different conditions that these people have from common health conditions to more rare genetic kinds of conditions that one might encounter in practice. All of these cases include some degree of assessment. And so that's actually important because an assessment provides faculty with an opportunity to examine students' capacity to do these assessments. For example, can they create the pedigree? Are they able to assess family history sufficiently through a case? Are they able to assess risk based on the information that they've collected throughout the case? Can they gather all that information and determine whether or not there is an indication for a genetic test? And if so, what test would that be and how would they proceed in regards to moving forward with the test? Um, and you can engage at any point in discussion with the learners. Um, in group education, you can divide into groups and have groups actually complete a case as a group and go through some of the supplemental activities and discussion points. Um, there can be additional faculty activities. I've never been so um, surprised by the novel ways that faculty have been able to come up with what kinds of additional activities they could add to these kinds of cases to make them interesting and, and as real life as possible. We've also had a number of people use G3C in a continuing education capacity. That includes just independent learning, that an individual sits down and actually does a case because they're either going to see a patient like this or they know that this is an area where they have a deficit and they need to improve some of their knowledge base. And we provide a lot of faculty support, and that includes faculty in the broadest sense of the term, both in academic and continuing education environments. So in addition to what Yi presented about the faculty guide that is case specific, G3C provides a large number of resources that are very helpful in just understanding you know, genomics and basic resources. A lot of these are resources that have been developed by the National Human Genome Research Institute, such as the Talking Glossary, um, the Image Gallery, and other kinds of things that faculty could find very useful in sort of planning how to integrate these kinds of tools in um, practice. We also provide an introduction to G3C, really talking more about this kind of experiential learning methodology as a way to stimulate thinking about how you could use it. Um, there are website overall objectives. So in addition to the case-specific objective that Yi spoke about, there is overall website objectives, target audience, and suggestions and how you could actually use G3C. Um, and each case, like we've mentioned, includes resources and supplemental activities and additional educational activities and the individual case guides. So the latest case that we have developed is on autism spectrum disorder and vaccines. And this particular case, if you look at the the picture of the actress here, what you can appreciate is that this actually, if you were looking at some of these slides as they were being presented as somebody that we've utilized before. And um, that's real life, right? We see patients at a variety of different time points depending on what could be occurring in their life. Um, and so now Di, who originally was seeking consultation in a prenatal setting, um, is now at the point of having a four-year-old son, and she is presenting for a discussion because he has what appears to be increasing developmental delays. He has speech and language difficulties. He's very hyperactive. Um, he has a lot of psychosocial issues. He has a lot of difficulty engaging with other children. And she's very concerned about these developmental delays and his behaviors and what may be causing this. Um, and so this particular case delves into the genetics of autism spectrum disorder 
and Fragile X. Um, and the objectives, of course, is how best to respond to Dai's question about these issues, including her, you know, suspicion, well, maybe it was associated with vaccines, um, and how genetic information and testing could actually apply to this particular case and that this, you know, would not be associated with vaccines. So we're going to actually show you a clip from this case so that you get a real feel for what this actually looks like on the website. Well, Ethan has had a speech delay. For instance, at age two, he couldn't form three to four word sentences. Um, at this point, he can say phrases, but he tends to repeat them a lot. He says, I want that over and over again. Um, he has short bursts of speech with disruptions in the flow. So he repeats a lot of sounds and words. So I'm going to conclude here. And um, I'm just going to mention that, you know, yes, uh, Yi and I are from the National Cancer Institute, but G3C is something that has been a longstanding collaboration between the National Human Genome Research Institute that pr provided the expertise and funding and platform to continue to develop um, G3C and bring it to you all. And um, we're actually very excited to continue that collaboration going forward. And we're happy to answer any of the questions that you may have. Well, we are happy to um, answer any questions. Um, the link to G3C is um, in the chat so that you're able to, you know, just, you know, click on it and bookmark it <clears throat> easily enough. Um, I don't see questions right now, but I think one of the things that we'd be happy to do is to actually show you a little bit more of these cases just to give you a better flavor for it. You know, this is all about, you know, the reality that in a learning environment, be it academic or continuing education, you may not have an opportunity to see these kinds of patients. And this is the best, not the best, but the best methodology that we could identify that was feasible to achieve and, and timely to be able to introduce these kinds of cases um, on the, the website uh, methodologies. So. I'm going to share my screen. And we're going to start with um, Dai and be able to help you understand when we first encountered Dai um, in the prenatal setting. I just found that I'm pregnant. Um, so I'm coming to start prenatal care. I work as a clinical nurse specialist at my hospital, and I'm definitely a planner. So I want to get things as organized as possible. So one of the features that you can see is this is how the question options open up to you. And we're going to pick this question because this was one of the reasons she wanted to start. I'm really concerned that since my husband and I are older, that that might affect the health of the baby. And I know that the California panel is only a small number of tests, whereas the whole genome sequencing has a much larger scope. And I also understand that whole genome sequencing can take a long time to set up, so that's why I'd like to get started so early in the process. Um, Kathy, I saw there is one um, question showed up. It's um, um, Allison, yeah, asked about the. Uh, uh, which professional or clinical groups are the modules geared uh, towards? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, go ahead. No, you can answer. Oh, sure. So um, so the uh, uh, professional and the uh, clinical groups, and uh, we are we are focusing, I think, on like two kinds of uh, setting. And the one is uh, continued education and uh, who are like, for example, like, uh, um, either physicians or um, um, nurses or um, um, profession in genetics, and, uh, and they are already in the uh, clinical practice, so they can utilizing this to either uh, explore topic and uh, 
um, like uh, or updating information they may uh, feel uh, needed at a, uh, this point of time they did not learn before. And uh, the other um, section it is uh, the um, uh, students who are in training and uh, um, like uh, which reflecting the like uh, professionals I um, talked before and yeah, like uh, physicians uh, in, in, in any kinds of uh, um, settings of uh, uh, nursing capacity and uh, from general nursing to professional nursing and uh, also in uh, genetic counselors training and I think uh, will be, a, um, will be a, uh, useful to uh, using this website. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I don't think I have anything additional to add, but I think that the key point that you brought up, which I'll just reinforce, is that this is for really any kind of health professional or student group who's training in the health professional capacity to be able to use. Um, and that can include faculty. You know, we have found that um, certainly in, you know, my background is in nursing, these is in the genetic counseling profession, so it would be different in that setting. But in nursing, for sure, we have found that a lot of faculty have difficulty teaching this content because they don't understand it themselves. And so sometimes these cases have been used just for self-learning in preparation for teaching um, about these kinds of issues in the classroom setting. Um, and so it, it expands across all groups who would be able to use these modules. They are intended to be basic and not highly technical and highly advanced um, because of the fact that we want to be able to reach any group in any profession across the board. Yeah. And we do have uh, additional reading or resource and uh, so they can explore if they want to advance the knowledge on that. And uh, the experts uh, commentaries and they are all like uh, experts who are familiar with this topic and uh, understanding the current like uh, either research or like uh, standing for this kind of issues in the uh, in professional setting. So definitely you can go from basic and the uh, um, to like events if you wanted to uh, explore some more. Yeah. And thanks, Alison, for the question. <laughs> yeah. And I think we have a very interesting um, question from Mexico. <laughs> yeah. And um, um, so, so um, um, this uh, uh, question is uh, Is it uh, ethical for companies, the bank, um, to have genetic information about people and because it could generate a kind of discrimination. Yeah, definitely. And uh, for example, and uh, giving a health insurance to someone who is likely to suffer from cancer. Yeah, I can comment you on the GINA like a perspective. Um, so um, they, there is, is a non-genetic discrimination act in the US. Um, but I do not know like what is the stand in Mexico, and uh, there are a, a broader like umbrella to uh, for pro protection regarding who are uh, who are not a, who someone who don't have the symptoms showing only carry the uh, genetic change. There is uh, um, there are certain like uh, protection for people getting um, like. Uh, uh, health insurance. Uh, however, like you brought up a great point on like there is no uh, like uh, um, like a standard uh, um, protection regarding life insurance and also it does not not apply to military as well. Um, uh, definitely there is uh, a mm, like a very importantly how health providers and in the community how we providing like information regarding genetics to uh, people who are interested for genetic testing. Now, Kathy, do you wanna comment on that? Yeah, I think one of the important points here is that this is complex. It's very different depending on the country. And even within a country, like you said here in the United States, there are people where these laws don't apply and there may not be laws in places like Mexico or other countries. The key, thing here is that, you know, this is a changing landscape in many different places. And so what's important in thinking about the use of 
of genetics and genomics in, in care is that they're having an encounter with a trained healthcare provider, whether that's a genetic counselor, a geneticist, or a genetic nurse. Um, they need to see someone who has a handle and a knowledge base on what's the landscape in that particular country and that particular environment. Um, I do want to make a comment about, like, for example, predisposition to cancer and other kinds of diseases. One of the things that's important in thinking about this is that, you know, that risk is there. Um, and we all have a risk for something, right? Um, and what that is being used for is to inform healthcare decision making to either detect that disease early or intervene early to minimize its effect um, or be able to modify that risk in some way, depending on what the nature of the problem is, you know, if it's cardiac condition versus cancer. Um, and so there are many different ways to think about this and not all of it is negative, but just knowing that somebody might be at risk for something, it's also informing their healthcare and, and there's an advantage to that. Not everyone sees it, but there is an advantage. And that's why it's so important that people need to see somebody who has an expertise in the um, environment to be able to um, explain that to patients so they can make an informed choice based on their environment and the landscape in their country. Yeah, I think uh, Kathy brought up uh, a good uh, point so regarding the informed uh, uh, decision making and uh, a uh, professional is able to explore all, all kinds of uh, either benefit or limitation or risk like uh, uh, about the genetic testing to someone who are uh, thinking about uh, having tests, I think is uh, very important. And also another thing I think is worth to mention is the uh, people make a decision on genetic testing maybe have a, a long period of time, maybe like a, a, a month or two years uh, or three years. Uh, I, I recently had a patient uh, like took uh, about two years. So he finally like thinking about uh, it's time for him to to do genetic testing. So so it's uh, as a, a professional, maybe you are not expecting someone um, give you an answer immediately. Yeah, it may take us a longer time for someone to make a decision. Yeah, I think we have another question. Kathy, you want to address? Yeah, so this question is, uh, what kind of uh, outreach are you doing to get this to uh, primary um, physicians and the clinical uh, settings where physicians may not be aware uh, that this resource exists so they can be better plan their care before they send a referral to genetics. And so there's a number of outreach activities that are going on both, you know, that are discipline specific and across all disciplines. And I'll highlight the one that we're doing um, today and this whole week, which is the Health Professional Genomic Education Week um, that is hosted by the National Human Genome Research Institute to try to engage people as broadly as possible and have these kinds of tools available um, so that individuals even who participate in this can disseminate this because these these sessions are being taped and are going to be available on Genome TV and other um, links through the Genome Institutes for viewing by others um, who did not attend or didn't hear about it for some reason. Um, we do spend a lot of time um, both on the side of the Genome Institute through the um, ISCC PEG, which is the Inter-Society Coordinating Center for Professional Education and Genetics, and I probably messed that up and I apologize. ISCC PEG is much easier, but that is the platform that um, in part, not in total, but in part is being used um, and is an, a mechanism for engaging all health professionals, pharmacy, medicine, and others 
to understand this better, to have experts who can begin to develop more resources for education and training, who are trying to disseminate within their practice specialty to upskill the capacity and competency of that group. Um, and there is a need for more people to engage and participate in ISCC PEG, which is you know, a, a great mechanism to be able to work with others and think about novel ways that could be used to engage these communities. Because all of us appreciate that, you know, there is a deficit in, you know, the number of people who could benefit from the use of genetic education and counseling and possibly testing, but that they're not getting the information that they need to have a referral and think about what can be done. Um, you know, all of us are committed to, you know, different mechanisms that are being used, like through the National Society of Genetic Counselors, where they're working on a variety of different outreach efforts. Um, the International Society of Nursing and Genetics and the Global Genomics Nursing Alliance, um, both are international groups with a similar mission of trying to move this out in the nursing community is another mechanism um, because many of these you know, physician providers do not work you know, alone in their practice and they have nurses that work with them. And so trying to get you know, this out from a grassroots kind of perspective and increase that capacity. Um, so there's a variety of things that are going on and we are, you know, always welcome to hear other ideas and strategies that haven't been considered. Um, but I'd encourage all of you who are participating to think about joining ISCC PEG as a mechanism to engage in this activity. Yeah, um, Kathy, I think um, uh, last point that you brought up um, about uh, we are interested to everyone contributing in this effort. And uh, there is uh, um, uh, one participant, uh, um, Adri Adriana, and um, um, I'm, if I pronounced your name wrong, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, and uh, then uh, the proposal is, uh, would you be uh, open to collaborating on the project to have this program available in other language, such as the Spanish? Yeah, I, I, th I think we thought about this uh, a long time ago. We would uh, be love to, right, Kathy? Yeah, we'd love to. We, we did have one um, case that actually was done in Spanish. It's difficult for us because, um, you know, I will say one of the genetic counselors in my group does speak Spanish, um, so that's good. Uh, but, you know, it is difficult for us to both maintain that and to have the right resources. So we would be very keen about working with people in other countries to, you know, disseminate a resource like this that could be used and modified for use in um, other countries. So that is something I think that we're very open to being able to do. Um, and that's partly some of the work that, um, you know, even ISCC PEG might be thinking about because even here in the US, um, we have, you know, a highly diverse population and different populations that, you know, do not speak um, English as their primary language and they have a lot of difficulty understanding some of this. So it is um, the kind of thing that we're quite interested in. Yeah. So you just have to reach out to us. Um, yes. Yeah, um, we, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, we'll put our emails in the chat and, and then you can always feel free to email us. So, yeah. Would love to um, collaborating and uh, bring this uh, platform to be a uh, uh, reach out to more community and uh, to benefit the uh, people uh, who wants to learn those uh, knowledge. Yeah, and uh, Luis had a question about uh, on uh, what do you think about the uh, 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 genetic genetics? Yeah, um, so I understand the where you're coming from. Um, from from my perspective, and we are we are really focusing on like a disease prevention 
and the how to manage your condition. Definitely is not a, to trying to uh, um, go through the route to give limit uh, leading about uh, the uh, variety of uh, genetics of uh, people. Yeah. And uh, um, for for the genetics community right now, like we are focusing on um, um, information that uh, it's uh, a we are able to approach, and there is a um, management uh, like a own place uh, can tell someone like for example, starting screening earlier can detect uh, either cancer or de detect the other kinds of uh, condition to happen, and uh, or like is there anything like. Um, um, uh, like, uh, mm, for example, in uh, pediatrics, if we identify the, some genetic uh, change, we could uh, like uh, predicting like later on something while showing up for um, the uh, the child. And there are different kinds of uh, interventions that can be utilized in the overall uh, management for the child. And uh, for example, like uh, some some are not just uh, showing as. Uh, a, a physical like a condition you can see they can be like a mental as well so on the line there will be um like interventions about uh, um seeing a uh, mental health provider or things like that can be helpful as well so the whole idea um is a uh, in genetic i think of uh, uh, from right now the standpoint it is about uh, to um prevent uh, um, like a uh, medical condition we can manage to happen and uh, or, or we can manage it better when it does happen. Yeah. Um, so Kathy, do you have any comments? No, I think it covered it. Please. So, um, okay. I see. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think one of the things we also want to do is kind of show you just the scope of these kinds of cases. And I'm going to, and it relates to some of what's been brought up here today. So I'm going to share the screen again and just give you a flavor of another case just to um, help you understand some of what is there, but I have too many, way too many things open. So I'm trying to get to. Well, uh, I'm here for my yearly physical and I uh, completed the ACT for health and you know the web ha and found out that i'm at an increased risk for breast cancer uh, my, my dad incidentally was um found to have the mutation brca2 which i was mm -hmm. under the impression that that can only be passed down by uh the mother's side of the family um but so we found out that's not true right and, right. and really i think the reason that we're here today is for me, it's primarily because I'm concerned about Jeff's health, and I guess I just want to make sure that you know we get this thing squared away. Uh, Jeff didn't tell me about it until recently, um, so this is really, I guess, n new to me also. Um, I got a genome s scan, like, I don't know, a couple months ago, so I know a lot about genetics, and so I feel like I'm, I don't, I mean, I just found out about this, but I, I'm here to learn more, is really why I'm here. We both are, and, and we're a little nervous about the genetic testing and the implication of the BRCA2 because of what it can be for our two kids. Right, exactly. that's so. my primary concern while we're here. Yes. So I wanted to go ahead and show this particular clip um, for a, a clear reason in, in relationship to what was discussed. Um, and if you go through a case like this, we do try to integrate different kinds of concepts throughout the cases, um, including ethical issues in the majority of these cases. And in this case, the issue of discrimination and concerns about discrimination uh, came up quite a bit because this individual, actually the male is in the military. Um, the individual who was considering the genetic test and was there with his wife. 
Um, and you can appreciate that there's, you know, a little bit of tension between the couple because he didn't share this information and she only learned about it recently. And so some of those kinds of things come up in the case. Um, and so there's a lot of different avenues for exploration, both if one just does the case, but also being able to pick out different components of the case and show that video and engage in discussions, which can be very country specific um, or environment specific about what would be relevant in a particular country. Um, Comment? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so as uh, as also we know that uh, uh, for uh, BRCA1 and 2 and the Lynch syndrome and uh, familiar hyperprostulemia as uh, the uh, uh, three condition was uh, on the uh, uh, CDC uh, like front line trying to for cancer prevention and uh, um, expanding the uh, screening for uh, population. And I think uh, this also address uh, um, the um, um, comments I had before is really focusing on something like uh, we are trying to um, think something we can use through genetic testing, we can prevent either to um, happen or catch it early. Like we know like the BRCA2, uh, it is associated with for male, it's uh, prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer, and uh, melanoma. And, um, and so for, uh, for those, especially uh, for prostate cancer, um, for BRCA2 is uh, starting at the age of 40. And for uh, for um, for PSA uh, screening and the digital rectal exam, and which is earlier than the uh, uh, general population, starting at the age of around like forty five. So uh, find uh, have this finding, um, have the the, uh, uh, the finding can help this male regarding the prostate cancer like uh, uh, screening start early, and uh, if you catch it early, and it's uh, uh, really it um, will be much more easier to manageable. Um, compared to uh, later. And uh, yeah, so that's uh, brought up uh, um, a point regarding that. And also the uh, uh, for female, the uh, BRCA2 associating will be like uh, breast uh, ovarian and uh, and uh, that like uh, can um, help with uh, the uh, management as well. Yeah. So I wanna just highlight a couple things from the chat. Um, and that is that um, Donna has gone ahead and put in information and the hyperlink to the Inter-Society Coordinating Committee for Practitioner Education and Genetics. Um, and that they're always welcome to have applications and, and there's no fee to participate. Um, and so that information is in the chat. And you can also just you know, follow what's happening in the ISCC PEG, you know, through their website. Mm, I can share another case um, for more uh, like uh, features we can have. Um, I'm, Kathy, I'm showing, I'm showing my screen. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, so this case is um, a, a lady with uh, potential uh, um, um, hyper um, um, uh, with a familiar hypercholesterolemia. And uh, um, from when we go to the uh, uh, case page, then we will have uh, have uh, um, some some like a description regarding this uh, uh, patient. And uh, when you also, we will have a link um, about the, the uh, case note. So it's uh, all PDF and uh, able to download. And so you can, um, you can see a form like this, it's uh, uh, showing. And uh, for this case, um, uh, first, uh, uh, usually you uh, begin the case is what brought you to the office today. And let's take a look. What well, I was referred here by my gynecologist. I went to see her because I got some abnormal cholesterol results from a health fair that I went to. So she told me to repeat the test, but without eating or drinking anything beforehand. So I did, and I was told the result of that would be here today. Um, and to be quite honest, I don't remember ever having my cholesterol checked before, 
So I was a little concerned with the numbers that came back. Yeah, as you can see here for Melissa, uh, Larissa, we picked, uh, uh, we choose um, a um, Spanish speaking uh, immigrants. And also she doesn't see a regular, uh, prime, she doesn't have a primary doctor. She used um, the uh, uh, GYN as her like annual like a checkup. And it's very common um, like uh, in the community. And um, the other like uh, uh, points we wanted to show is uh, um, sometimes if uh, um, in in the in this kind of uh, family, sometimes the uh, in information can be uh, family information can be uh, limited. So in the in the education um, this process, uh, we're trying to integrate in those kind of cultural like relevant uh, to um, to the uh, the case. So. Um, uh, learners uh, can have some idea regarding the cu cultural components uh, regarding um, the case, not just uh, um, see the patient as a, um, as a, a disease uh, condition. Yeah, so, and uh, there is uh, another feature I wanted to uh, share with you is uh, um, we, so when we go to the case, this is how you will see in the website. And there are different cases uh, show uh, showing up, so you can you can filter uh, um, the case through um, category, and and also um, like uh, like you can see here, there are um, um, the um, heart condition, there are cancer risk or, or, uh, assessment, child case, uh, uh, cystic fibrosis, and uh, and the um, the uh, uh, factor five laden and the diabetes. And uh, so you can choose from a, a different variety, depends on what a kind of uh, um, condition you are interested. And also there is uh, a um, uh, menu regarding, uh, you wanted to be more advanced case, intermediate. So, so it's very, uh, um, it's built uh, to as a learning like a purpose. And when you go to go through all the case, there is another feature I wanted to show you, which is a recommend maker recommendations. So that's is the way that uh, uh, this website is uh, set to assess your knowledge. When you go through uh, um, the case uh, for uh, a period of time and learned enough, doing enough learning activity, then you could have uh, some ability able to make recommendations. So that is uh, how it's an assessment that uh, um, the um, um, the teacher can sign for students to do, and uh, and they can. Um, so this is uh, how it look like. Yeah, like a different. Uh, it's a multiple choice uh, uh, section. Yep. Mm. Trying to stop sharing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't see any other questions coming in, but certainly we've given you the email and you're welcome to go ahead and, and contact us with other questions. Um, the link to G3C is in the chat. Um, and we are working on a new case. Yi, do you want to describe that case? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. So um, we right currently we are working on a case that is uh, associated with uh, um, um, hyper. Um, it's associated with uh, a cardiac uh, syndrome, and uh, we are trying to um, focusing on the uh, uh, Native American population. Um, so have uh, mm, cultural um, elements regarding the uh, um, some of uh, the uh, um, elements of the uh, um, professional encounter with someone with uh, a Native American background, or what uh, kind of um, um, information they should uh, keep in mind, and um, and and also with the prevalence regarding the cardiac condition, and to think about what kind of genetic testing you can offer, and and also how you can refer to a geneticist for or genetic counselor for um, ordering the test, and uh, in this uh, whole route uh, and. Things so we should be aware how cardiac condition is associated with uh, genetics and also with uh, a Native American background. 
And, and one of the other features associated with this particular case is the issues associated, at least here in the US, um, the Native American population has a specific health system, which is the Indian Health Service, um, which is different from other health systems within the US. Um, and there is concern about um, the use of genetics and eligibility to continue to uh, be, able, be able to get their health care through the Indian Health Service. Um, and so what you can appreciate throughout all of this is that, you know, our objective is to try to integrate a variety of different kinds of issues into these cases. Um, and, and that actually mimics real life because, you know, patients don't just come in with a particular issue. There's a variety of different considerations for every patient. Um, and so we're trying to make sure that what's developed is reflective of the broader population as a whole and the kind of challenges and considerations associated with um, those things. Yeah, so stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, I think we have a, the last question. Yeah, who is coming from Louis? I just learned that you are a high schooler. <laughs> Thank you for joining. And uh, um, uh, the question is uh, like, uh, why do you decide uh, to be a researcher? Yeah, um, yeah. For me, I think uh, um, I wanted to explore what is um, um, unknown. And it's uh, so much, so much like we do not know, and we're trying to find the answer. So I would love to be the uh, person in this uh, puzzle of um, um, finding what is the reason. Maybe I can answer some of the question in the end, but maybe I will be more confused. But <laughs> but in the process, it is uh, very uh, like. Uh, uh, interesting for myself and also I, I think uh, uh, very importantly is uh, uh, public uh, service uh, like how to um, uh, serve the community and uh, very importantly is um, I uh, love to work to coming from the community and uh, learn what uh, the people are need and how research can meet that um, can reach the end for uh, what, a, what, a, what is needed in the, um, in the people we are serving. Yeah, and and for me, the the motivation to become a researcher was really about trying to identify things that work, right? I started in oncology. I've always worked in oncology, and being able to identify things that work, treatments that work, you know, symptom management that works, care delivery that works. Um, and the only way to get at that is to study it in a systematic fashion because it's not just he said, she said, or, you know, well, we did this in our setting and so that's what we do here. Um, and so that's what drove me to wanting to be a researcher. Now, I always worked in a research environment. And if you have an interest in research, I'd encourage you to look at some of the resources through the National Institutes of Health at NIH.gov, um, where they also offer opportunities for students um, to experience the research environment, like the summer students and um, post-baccalaureate students. Um, so there are many opportunities for people to be exposed to you know, a research-intensive environment um, through the National Institutes of Health. And it's NIH.gov. And then if you put in like summer students or something, that is the, um, the link for those kinds of things. Um, but NIH.gov is the, the platform okay. for being able to provide that. I can try to um, put the link in the chat yeah. for students specifically. But all institutes, the Genome Institute, which hosts G3C and is hosting this Genome Education Week, as well as the Cancer Institute and all of the many institutes within the NIH are very focused on 
um, these kinds of trainings and uh, Yi and Dana put in the links um, so that you can look it up. Thank you for all those questions. And thank you for joining our session. Yes. Yeah, feel free to reach out to us uh, um, if you are interested uh, in any like uh, um, topics we addressed uh, today, or you have some innovative way how to um, expanding the G3C, we would love to hear. Thank you. Thank you.